Hi, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us at today's uh, session, APEN 54 meeting, and rent support for access to rural or remote, remote sites. So my name is Bin Lei. I'm the manager of Singapore Advanced Research and Education Network, Singaran. So uh, I'm very glad to be chairing this session today. So today uh, we have uh, distinguished speakers from Sri Lanka, Thailand, Bhutan, and Uganda. And they shall be sharing their experiences on how their institutions have enabled the use and access to information and communications technology, ICT, and to benefit their education institutions in the rural areas and also to share their future plans. So if you have questions for the speakers, please post them via the Q&A box and, or via the Wuga chat. So our speakers will address your questions during the panel session. So first, uh, now I would like to in first introduce our first speaker. So he is the Chief Operating Officer, Digital Transformation at Brandix Sri Lanka. He's also the former Director General of Telecommunications Regulatory Commission of Sri Lanka and Chairman CEO, Information Communication and Technology Agency of Sri Lanka. So let us welcome Mr. Oshada Sanayaki to deliver his talk entitled Digital Inclusivity Through Rural Connectivity Enablement as a Solution for Addressing Digital Divide. So let's welcome Mr. Oshada Sanaki. Thank you, Mr. Bin Lei, and it's a great privilege to be part of the APAN 54 session and uh, also discussing a very interesting topic, which I would love to uh, share a few insights from the case study, uh, which we've gone through in Sri Lanka itself. Um, so moving forward, just a bit about Sri Lanka. Um, as you would know, Sri Lanka uh, was well known for its um, tourism, but of course, we are also now known for going through unprecedented um, economic challenge uh, due to the after effects of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, are, we are just a very small island of 22 million people, but then we've been, make, may be making very strong strides on the digital front. Now that comes uh, to a key aspect of why we require uh, rural connectivity. In fact, 81% uh, of Sri Lanka is still rural. Um, that, that may be not known. And of course, we've been coming out of a, a civil conflict uh, and also the latest challenge of the COVID-19, which meant that key audiences such as our education uh, in terms of our children, there are 4.2 million uh, children that's on the K-12 education system at any given point in Sri Lanka. And also our university students had to transform into the new adage of working online and studying online. And that really exposed exactly the situation we have in terms of rural connectivity. So um, some of the stats I have thought I would quickly share. Um, as you would see, uh, the fixed line connectivity, or if we call it the fiber broadband connectivity, uh, is still at a very low level in Sri Lanka. But of course, it's quite expanding. And I'll tell you how, that, how we looked at um, enabling fiber connectivity across the country to ensure that we have the base, I believe, for digital transformation for any country. Uh, the connectivity is the underlying key piece uh, that we need to, the foundational piece that we need to work on. So if you look at it, you can see the staggering increase in terms of the mobile data connectivities that has been required uh, across the years, and then we can see how it has evolved. Um, from a perspective of the country, um, we had a strategy of ensuring a digital government approach where we wanted to ensure that citizens um, are, are enabled by digital services, which is enabled by digital uh, literacy. That is a key aspect. As much as we continue to enable certain systems and citizen services, it's imperative that we also look at the um, digital um, literacy of the people. Um, so while we've been looking at the shared digital services and platforms and also uh, developing uh, highly available systems going into the cloud, the cloud-first approach, again, we came back to that whole tenet of how do we really look at the connectivity piece? How do we engage with the telecommunications sector of the country in ensuring uh, that we drive this forward uh, as a national initiative that is imperative for uh, the envisioned uh, digital transformation or the digital economy of the country. Today, um, there's no other better explanation of how countries has to move forward from a traditional economy, where today Sri Lanka is unfortunately a good case study of um, uh, how uh, the economies has to be evolved into a more digital 
economy to sustain um, black swan events such as COVID. And then for years, we've been relying too much uh, on our traditional exports like tea and also the services exports such as um, the tourism industry. But now is the time to ensure that we look at the ICT industry, which is a very vibrant industry in Sri Lanka. So moving forward to the, the key point of our conversation today. So how did we look at narrowing the digital divide across these couple of years? As you would know, the first wave of COVID uh, struck us uh, in early 2020. Um, and at that point, um, we wanted to start our own universal service obligation project. Now, a lot of countries have their own universal service obligation project, um, but Sri Lanka did not have one. Uh, it was only as a concept on paper. Um, but we didn't have a concerted effort on it. And uh, at this moment, we connected with the International Telecommunication Union. A lot of you all would know that the ITU has a Connect 2030 agenda that focuses on five tenets of growth, inclusiveness, sustainability, innovation, and partnerships. So it was imperative that we align with the Connect 2030 agenda, which we did. And, and I'll explain how we looked at this um, uh, Connect Sri Lanka project. So the prime focus of the Connect Sri Lanka project was ensuring 100% 4G and broadband connectivity across the country. So how did we do it? We came up with the operational plan. We figured out that um, we cannot take it on a siloed approach. We couldn't do it on a piecemeal approach. So um, Sri Lanka is broken down into 25 districts. Um, what we did initially was we ensured that we do a national survey on understanding exactly what districts have what levels of connectivity. Now that was a daunting task uh, just before COVID. And we ensured that we work with local administrative services and ensure that we went into a granular point of the local village administrations. In Sri Lanka, we have about 16,000 uh, village administrative uh, components. So we reached out to each and every one of them and asked very simple questions of, do you have 4G? Do you at least have 3G or do you not even have uh, the basics of even a 2G connection? So this gave us a very, very uh, stark uh, uh, picture of exactly where things are. Uh, we've always been only looking at the reports from the telco sector, but there was a key issue over the uh, reports that we got from the telco sector. The telco sector had a metric of measuring uh, coverage by population not by geography, but we as the telco regulator at that time, which I was heading, we want a geographic coverage. So it didn't matter where um, the citizens were, it didn't matter where the children were. And we ensured that we got uh, a real picture and I'll show you some examples how we did it. So the coverage assessments, as you see, um, we had our mobile um, spectrum analyzers that we had. Uh, we sent around the country to ensure that we have uh, uh, um, samples of this data and we validated them. It was very important that we did that. And this one um, district that we started off this universal service obligation project, uh, the Ratnapura district, uh, it's in uh, mid Sri Lanka for all of you all who have visited. Um, and we took this district for one a particular key reason. Um, it was a quite a tough terrain. There was mountains, there's valleys and all of that. So we thought let's benchmark uh, and baseline on a tough terrain to understand how long would it take for us to put the infrastructure such as the mobile towers to ensure that we connect this um, uh, area. So Rathapur district, if you look at the geographic uh, aspects of it, you know, it, it was a base of 1.2 uh, million people, a geographical area of 3,200 kilometers, quite, quite a small considering the other countries. Uh, but um, in, in Sri Lanka, there is a very large area uh, of, of a district. And, and what we did was we ensured that we went over and looked at even the enablement aspect. We looked at how much of national schools were there in that area. We looked at how much of um, uh, other provincial schools were there. In fact, we figured out there are 598. And, 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 and part of that plan was not just putting towers and ensuring 4G. We realized, look, um, we need to parallelly ensure that we enable each and every one of these schools with connectivity to ensure that new concept of online um, uh, teaching, the online education, which was imperative. And, and I'll show you an example, which is quite striking, um, where uh, children at, at a certain point in Sri Lanka was on the sides of the road uh, trying to study because there was not enough coverage. So you see here is a sample snapshot of exactly how we got these statistics. These are all on, uh, on your left is all the villages. And you can see it's all reds. Right, and we had a classification of the signals on non decibel levels. You can see on the uh, display, and we ensured that we got the statistics and we normalized it. And based on that, we did we did a simulation and we came up with the number of telco towers and fiberizations that's required on that area with a clear timeline. So some of the snapshots of the sites visit, so you can see it, it's deep rural. 
Um, it's not the typical areas that you would go along. Um, these are the regulatory teams as well as the telecommunication teams joining in. Um, so it was a um, literal 24 hour uh, spring boot for a, a whole year in understanding all of this. And then and, and you can see there's not even roads. And this is a striking image on the uh, lower left, lower right, where you can see children are, are studying in a mud hut. So let alone internet, I mean, these children are studying on this sort of infrastructure. So while we were doing the connectivity, we want to go one step and ensure um, that we try and give connectivity to these schools and also look at the device enablement piece. I think that's a very important point uh, that we understood. One aspect is the connectivity, but what about the device enablement? Because at the end of the day, um, the accessibility piece is quite important as well as the coverage. Um, and then uh, as you see, these the same school that we transformed, we put up an IT lab sometime back. And for each of these areas, what we did was with the telco sector, with a private public partnership, because obviously the government sector would not have funding for all of this. And uh, it was a, a fantastic case study of a public private partnerships where while we kept on giving uh, the connectivity, we also ensured each and every school was enabled by small IT labs that they can access uh, these aspects. Um, we've launched some of smart boards and smart screen screens as well uh, as we went along. Again, these are uh, a deep rural school that you see uh, that we were there and you could see how the teacher is actually uh, using that smart classroom board. Uh, again, completely enabled uh, as a public private partnership, just to give example how this went. So right now, uh, this project has uh, been activated in 10 districts out of the 25 districts. We've enabled over 1,000 villages so far, I means the challenges of COVID as well. It was a start and stop. And uh, it continues to uh, aim to its target of a 500, uh, uh, sorry, 100% uh, um, connectivity aspect. Now, while we were doing it, uh, the next question was, um, how do we deliver the content? Uh, so the next aspect uh, wearing my hat on the GovTech of Sri Lanka, we came up uh, with uh, the e-learning platform that we wanted to use, um, which was completely built on Moodle with, again, the support of the um, IT industry and volunteer services. And we started um, digitalizing content. And uh, I think the major achievement out of this was ensuring completely free access to this portal. So two years back, um, when we started off, we had about 1,000 to 1,500 visits per day, which is negligible. Um, today, I can proudly say uh, we have over 6 million hits per day in terms of traffic uh, onto the platform, and it's completely free of all data charges. So while it was started during the COVID-19 period as a temporary uh, free access, um, the telco sector uh, uh, got in uh, tied up with the telecommunication regulator um, and, and, and ensured that it's a permanent CSR. So today, um, the, the, the children, the parents who want to do school uh, homeschooling, uh, as well as the um, teachers have complete free access. So a child could watch content for even 20 hours per day. I wouldn't advise that, of course, too much screen time, but uh, it will be zero cost in terms of cost. As long as they have internet connection, um, we whitelisted the complete uh, eTaxalava e-learning platform, which covers from grade one to advanced level. Um, not only did we stop from there, we also went on to enable the uh, Lanka Education and Research Network, the Learn platform, which is used by all state universities. And today it's also completely accessible free of charge. So not only did we look at the um, accessibility, but we also look at the affordability piece. Uh, that was a huge challenge. Um, and then we continue to uh, drive this project forward uh, with support. Um, uh, some of the, since I'm running out of time, some of uh, the key uh, steps from a technical angle, which we took in tandem was, as you would know, um, uh, exponentially during COVID-19, the demand for uh, data uh, increased in Sri Lanka. March 2020 saw 44% 44 increase in the demand for data traffic within a week from the first lockdown, which meant we required new spectrum to be rolled out. We required new infrastructure to be rolled out. And we ensured that uh, we introduced a spectrum management framework to ensure that uh, additional spectrum is conveyed and, and awarded to uh, the telecommunication sector. We also ensured brand sharing, radio access network sharing initiatives. Uh, it's about to be approved right now. It was a lot of work, which we worked with the International Telecommunication Union consultancies. We've started the 5G trials as well, and uh, we've got the radio tele telecommunication equipment rules as well to ensure that we have a good hygiene in the digital environment because we didn't want used uh, um, phones and all of that coming in and uh, getting into the hands of our children. Uh, so that looks at all the metrics of uh, the, the health aspect, the digital health aspect in terms of emissions and all of that. And we've streamlined that aspect as well. Then the most important in terms of affordability, 
Um, as I mentioned, we managed to completely whitelist and make available free the e-learning platform of Sri Lanka, both for universities and the K-12 uh, schools. But we also ensured that we, we gave new packages for work from home and study from home, which enable uh, the rural community where, where there's a lot of people working uh, uh, from the rural areas, uh, the ability to basically connect um, uh, quite fast in, in terms of uh, this digital journey uh, of working from home or studying from home. And some of the other key strategic initiatives uh, was the amendment of the Telecommunication Act. Uh, we ensured the number portability project uh, got off the ground in Sri Lanka right now, it's been implemented. Again, we believe it's very important to create parity where we ensure that the consumer has a lot of uh, agility in terms of selecting the uh, service providers in terms of digital connectivity or telecommunication connectivity that will drive down the pricing more. Um, and uh, I should state at this moment, the success of this um, on the latest telecommunication uh, benchmarking report on pricing by the ITU, Sri Lanka stands on the 20th rank for the most cheapest broadband. Um, you come to the top 10 for the first time in history uh, for most affordable um, mobile broadband. We are on the eighth place and we've also achieved the seventh place in the most cheapest uh, voice services. So I think this is in line with the Connect 2030 agenda of the ITU as well, where um, it, there was one KPI that we had to cut down the cost to less than 3% of the monthly income of a particular citizen of a country. And most importantly, the last uh, one before the last bullet point, we started developing our own telco towers in Sri Lanka rather than importing. Today, it has put us in good state where we've run out of forex, unfortunately, as a country, and still this project is continuing because we are manufacturing our our own telco tower constructions. Um, so this is the journey which we've had. And, and I think uh, um, uh, you, you would see uh, how, how far we've come through on that. And then from a point of uh, our children, um, uh, even, even going to uh, extents of even um, getting into trees and on, on the side of the roads because they couldn't access the e-learning today after two years, um, it's work in progress, but we made significant strides in reducing the digital divide. Um, and, and I hope this might be a good canvas for uh, other countries to follow as well. And of course, something that I couldn't state was the, with the Connect Sri Lanka project, uh, for all identified rural areas, the regulator invests 50% of the capital expenditure as per the universal service, service obligation uh, fund concept of ITU. So that's an incentive for them as well, uh, where I, if it doesn't make financial sense for them to invest, well, uh, we are now investing 50% of our USO funding. So uh, that has really accelerated things. So I believe this would have given a quick update and I would uh, stop at this point since I've run out of time. And thank you for this opportunity to share a few thoughts from our end, how we've uh, addressed the digital divide. Thank you. Hey, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Oshada Sanak. Yaki for sharing with us uh, your initiatives in Sri Lanka to uh, drive uh, the uh, and real access to all this um, electro uh, digital uh, to actually bridge the digital divide. So uh, next, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. So she is the first uh, Thai national to be inducted into the in Internet Hall of Fame by the Internet Society in August 2013. So she was honored with the Jonathan B. Postal Service Award for pioneering Thailand's internet in November 2016. So she's a research professor at Internet Education Research Lab, Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand. So let us welcome Prof. Kanchana, Kanchana Sud to deliver her talk on reaching rural communities with NRANS. Prof. Kanchana, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Let me set my time <laughs> so, so I will not go beyond the time. Okay, right. Uh, thanks for inviting me to share with you my experience. I may be different from the first speaker because my involvement uh, with the internet, the internet, it came from my own personal uh, interest in uh, you know, building up uh, the network. So uh, I I write to share with you my experience from 2013, where we uh, started to build a community network in Thailand. Okay, share screen. We. Oui. Let me, okay. Uh, 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, I am from the Asian Institute of Technology in Thailand. Thailand is in Southeast Asia, and uh, we uh, perhaps at the moment, uh, in terms of connectivity, we we are doing quite well. Uh, but in 2013, when we when we started working on this problem, it was not uh, at this level. Okay, so uh, in two, 2013, why I started to work on this project is because uh, that was right after the big uh, a big flood in Thailand, where uh, we we were out of communication in some places, and uh, you know I was trying to propose a solution to help them, but nobody was prepared to listen at that moment. So I thought that uh, in order to introduce technology to uh, the community, it's better to have that technology uh, in use in, in their daily life. So I try to uh, introduce the technology to uh, the rural community so that they are familiar with technology and in case of disaster, they can help themselves. So that was the idea. So I started uh, with um, <coughs> a camp, a student camp. So, you know, all my projects, uh, we did not, rely on big grants. We only uh, uh, you know, rely on low cost uh, equipment and try to, to, uh, to build everything from you know, small contributors. So we got sponsorships from you know, various organizations to run a camp. And uh, we use uh, very small devices, uh, device like what you can see in the, this slide, uh, a T, you know, TP link. But we used uh, our own uh, our own firmware, which is uh, uh, which was developed from our research project with the France uh, with the Hypercom project at Inria. Uh, we uh, we had a test bed to run uh, um, our mobile ad hoc network for post disaster mitigation called Dumbo. And we had several uh, experiments, uh, number one, two, three, uh, before 2013. And the first one was on elephant back, and that was in 2006 in Phuket, right uh, kind of after the tsunami in Phuket. Yeah, uh, all these. Um, uh, it, Testbed and experiments convinced us that the technology was stable enough to be in use. But um, unfortunately, when we had big flood, uh, we could not introduce the technology because uh, nobody, everyone was so busy and they didn't want to listen to anything new. So <clears throat> by from that, we uh, built a network uh, gradually. And by today, we have uh, about 400, uh, 400 households and um, 40 gateways uh, from our network. Uh, when we first went in to the, to the village, there were, at that time, they only have a DSL link to the village, only uh, two, two lines, you know, two, uh, no internet, I mean, no, um, and direct link. So uh, from that day until now, we have they have uh, several commercial ISPs in uh, offering uh, their services to to them. So <clears throat> what we are we are doing today is that we we subscribe to uh, commercial ISPs. So we have a gateway to ISPs. Okay, so uh, you have uh, like about 10 households joining one, one connection to the ISP and you can have, you can choose the different ISP as you wish. Yeah. And they share the cost, so it's much lower for them to, 
to uh, pay for the subscription. So <clears throat> that became, uh, became stable and our technology, uh, sorry, I'll go back to this again. Um, our network is a flat network. So you have, uh, uh, you know, it's like one big uh, local area network. So you, uh, but the, uh, the sites, our network sites can be uh, in different provinces. So we, uh, what we did was to uh, allow them to have virtual link, you know, virtual long haul link uh, through the Bangkok uh, IX. Okay, so this is a kind of uh, research project for our students to work on. So <clears throat> uh, they can, uh, you know, each uh, site that have their own gateway can send, uh, can be connected to net to home <clears throat> at uh, Bikenix in Bangkok. Uh, the connection is by VPN and they can uh, communicate from the, low, the first side to the second side and so on. So uh, on the left-hand side, everything is like one big network, what big uh, local area networks. Okay, so uh, there are many activities that you can do on that. Okay, the advantage of doing this is that the people in the rural area can benefit from the IXP because at the IXP, you can have uh, many uh, provider that uh, provide cloud services and also uh, content delivery. So you can have, they can have access to international content that uh, uh, you know, made, made themselves available at the I IXP. So they uh, benefit from this setting. Okay, so uh, on another side, another group of my team are uh, working on um, uh, air quality monitoring. So uh, we set up our sensor network inside the this, this, uh, uh, villages and monitor the air quality, the uh, PM 2.5. Okay, so we can have real time uh, reading of the um, of the PM 2.5 from our network. Another research activity that we we did was the, we are doing actually uh, is the, to build. Um, uh, distributed ledger system in the village because um, people were actually uh, doing the uh, trading by uh, taking note of you know of the credit already you know on paper right so instead of uh, doing uh, instead of uh, using the paper we try to introduce them. Uh, to use the, uh, this um, device to uh, keep your ledger and uh, build a distributed ledger in our network on, on the 400, uh, uh, you know, 400 nodes in our system. But of course, we don't put our devices everywhere. Okay, so we build a kind of overlay network on, on our 400 houses. And we use the blockchain technology to uh, to keep track of the ledgers. Another research activity that we did on this network is to uh, run a, a TV white space uh, testbed. Okay, we uh, we got a research grant by the uh, the. Uh, NBTC, which is the Thai regulator for uh, frequency allocation. So um, al that allow us to experiment using uh, TV white space in, in our area. Okay, so uh, we also, at, you know, our first uh, application that we dream of in using this uh, uh, community network was to deliver uh, EDU content to the to the villagers 
because um, at night the network is hardly used, so you can download uh, EDU stuff to to uh, to homes, and uh, students can uh, have uh, high quality access to video content and so on. But we found that uh, this project could not work well because of the copyrights problem, so we have to drop the idea. Uh, Okay, so by today, we are doing, uh, you know, um, air quality monitoring. We are uh, encouraging uh, villagers to use our ledger and also uh, to provide, you know, to do their, their trading on the internet using our platform and, uh, you know, uh, having all kind of, uh, sharing in the in the in the village sharing of resources like if you have a bicycle free to be used by other uh, friends you can announce that okay so this kind of activity is now uh, ongoing being promoted okay so uh, that is about all what we are doing so after the Pan during the pandemic, actually, we found that um, Bangkok, uh, Bangkok children also suffer from this, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, remote uh, education that they had to stay at home and access the classes uh, from home. And people in the slum area, they don't even have, uh, you know, facility to attend their classes. So we extend our uh, network to uh, from the slum area in Bangkok. Um, of course, th the slum area is very big. We only touch uh, one corner of it, and uh, we we uh, you, we work with um, the facility that was left over by Google, and it's uh, now uh, still being used by the slum slum uh, kids. Okay, so. You may ask, uh, how could I do all this as a professor in a university? Uh, okay, we started uh, by, you know, we, I, start, I used uh, various uh, research grants and projects and so on. And in order to, uh, to make uh, the whole thing sustainable, I, I try to uh, formulate everything into this, uh, this picture. Okay, we set up one company. It's a, a social enterprise called Net to Home. Okay, that, that company, uh, you can have a look at this on net to homecoth uh, I put my the money that I got from the John Postel Prize to this to set up this uh, operation. And uh, uh, I myself stay in a uh, uh, AIT in uh, interlab uh, research, uh, it, doing a R and D for the whole the whole project, and we try to build the local community uh, to handle uh, every to you know to look after themselves. So they they collect their own money, pay for the uh, ISP fees and so on. Okay, so uh, the Net to Home company would try to find. Uh, equipment needed for the operation, but the technical manpower is uh, you know, handled by the local people. So that, that, is, the, uh, that is how we are uh, running at the moment. Okay, so the question is, how can NREN take part in this? Okay, all, everything that I did so far, I didn't mention NREN. Uh, I am a member of Tyran from uh, the, you know, from day one, and uh, of course, I got a lot of help from my colleagues in in Tyran and in you know in Uninet and Taisan and so on. But uh, there's no uh, formal arrangement. Uh, things were done uh, according you know whenever I need and. So uh, I think uh, what we should do as a group 
uh, I mean, like a pen. Perhaps in the future, we try, we, we should have uh, a venue that we encourage young members, young researchers uh, to take up rural challenges as their research project. Because uh, so far I found that my young colleagues always had, always argued that, oh, I cannot write papers. I cannot get my, you know, promotion if I get involved in this type of work. It's not true. There are so many uh, challenging issues, challenging problems that you can, you can uh, technically uh, write a uh, very good paper. So uh, we try to, you should, we should change this kind of mindset among uh, Tyrant, ah, uh, sorry, NREN members. And NREN themselves should promote and facilitate agile IT infrastructures, you know, like try to build this type of infrastructure, have test bed to run, because it's becoming more and more important, particularly after the pandemic. You, you really have to think about that seriously. And we have to extend NREN services uh, to the rural area. You know, be part of the C local CDN, national CDN, uh, build up, build up micro data centers uh, that are accessible by the rural people. I think uh, that's my recommendation for everyone. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you, Prof. Kanchana, for uh, sharing the initiatives that you have done in Thailand and also your insights about the topic. Thank you very much. Okay, so next uh, I'd like to introduce our third speaker. So he's the Deputy Chief Information Communication Officer, Department of Information Technology and Telecom, Ministry of Information and Communications, Delvu in Bhutan. So let us now welcome Mr. Kama Jamyang, who will be delivering his talk on Drakren, Superhighway for R&E Community of Bhutan. Mr. Kama, please. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, this is Kama Jamyang. I'm from uh, Druk Research and Education Network, uh, National Research and Education Network in Bhutan, and Ren in Bhutan. Uh, I'm privileged uh, to be here presenting on the Drukren, uh, which is a super highway for research and education community of Bhutan. I will also touch on today's theme, uh, how Drukren has supported access to uh, the education uh, institutes located in rural and remote sites in Bhutan. <clears throat> This is the outline. Uh, before I go ahead and talk about the NREN, Duke Research and Education Network, I want to uh, uh, present on the National Fiber Optic Network, which is a, which is a fiber optical network in Bhutan, uh, managed by my organization, Department of IT and Telecom. Uh, and also, I will also talk about the status of Duke Research and Education Network, where, where we and now, uh, where are we right now? So this is the uh, physical uh, topology of the National Fiber Optic Network, uh, which was completed in sometime in 2012. <clears throat> so what we have done is we have built uh, a National Fiber Optic Network uh, connecting all 20 districts. Uh, there are 20 districts in Bhutan. So we have connected all 20 districts with the OPGW fiber. And further, we have connected, uh, strung the fiber, connecting the 203 uh, blocks of villages. So what we have done is we have leveraged on the uh, power infrastructure to, to string the fibers. So all these fibers are on the uh, power transmission towers. So uh, this has this project has basically helped us uh, uh, reduce the digital uh, divide 
and also uh, for the fact that this fiber infrastructure is being used by the telecom operators in Bhutan, the internet service providers in Bhutan to take the services to, uh, to, to the villages, to the remote communities, to the to rural areas, uh, besides the uh, towns and cities. So all the telecom operators use this infrastructure. Uh, and what we have done is we have leased these fibers at zero cost. We don't charge the telecom operators and internet service providers when they lease these fibers from us. So what we have done is uh, the Druk Research and Education Network, we have also leveraged on the National Fiber Optic Network. We lease a pair of fiber and then we build uh, our uh, infrastructure. Uh, earlier, we didn't have a research and education network in Bhutan in, 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 uh, before 2014. Uh, it was only in uh, 2014 when we received uh, technical assistance from the TN4 project uh, and also NSRC, uh, where they helped us identifying potential members and also finalizing the Drukren uh, technical design and as well as the operation model. Uh, we also finalized business model with the help of uh, TN, uh, a very good friend of mine, Patch Lee. I think he's one of the attendants uh, in today's uh, session. So, and also we thank the NSRC who played a very instrumental role in helping us design uh, the, the uh, research and education network. So, then we got the approval uh, in late 2015 from the government to establish Ukraine. And then uh, that is when we first uh, started, uh, our journey started in 2016. <clears throat> Today, the Duke Research and Education Network is operated and managed by a small Dukren team in uh, my organization. So this was our design when we started off. Uh, we, we connected 10 districts. Uh, we built about uh, 11 point of presence uh, throughout the country. Uh, and we interconnected uh, 28 uh, research and education institutes, high research and education institutes, the universities. So we built a 10 GPPS uh, high-speed link, uh, leveraging on, the, again, the National Fiber Optic Network. And we used the, the last mile fiber infrastructure belonging to the uh, telecom operators and ISPs to connect those institutes. <clears throat> And then sometime in uh, August 2017-18, we uh, connected to the Global Research and Education Network through uh, National Knowledge Network uh, in India. So this was uh, how we started in 2016. So I'll briefly touch on the, the layer one design, how we have designed our network. Uh, earlier situation, as I informed you in 2016, we started off uh, building 11 POPs uh, using national fiber optics. And we leveraged, uh, we used, we deployed CWDM uh, technology in our backbone. And uh, when it comes to connecting the, the members, we connected using the last mile fiber belonging to the internet service provider. Uh, so the problem with the earlier design was we had some issues uh, we had only, because we had built the backbone using the uh, CWM infrastructure, uh, we had uh, limited uh, 10G links. And also uh, it was not scalable to 40 and 100 gig. And also we did not have, uh, we had limited or no fiber to connect uh, uh, new members apart from that, besides 28 uh, high research education institutes. We wanted to connect all the schools. We wanted to connect all the hospitals, all the research and education institutes. But the issue was we did not have the last mile fiber. So what we did was then uh, we uh, introduced DW infrastructure in our backbone. So now our backbone infrastructure is capable of doing 40 gig and 100 gig. We have built multiple 10 gigs. Uh, then, <clears throat> We have also uh, started uh, extending fibers 
to all the research and education institutes, schools and hospitals. The schools are located in the remote area. As you all know, uh, Bhutan is the uh, mountainous countries, uh, mountainous country, but somehow we have managed to connect all the schools and hospitals located in remote areas using fiber. Uh, and then <clears throat> in some cases uh, where we have limited fiber, we uh, leveraged on CWGM technology to connect our uh, new members. So this, all these new member, uh, they connect to our backbone infrastructure, I'd either 100 meg or one gigabit per second speed. So this is the Ukraine as it stands today. Uh, uh, we have extended our uh, backbone uh, to uh, interconnect all 20 districts. So now we are present in all 20 districts. Uh, the backbone is all 10 gigabit per second uh, built using uh, fiber infrastructure on DWM infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, connected uh, we have identified 193 schools to be connected and also 90 plus institutes, including hospitals and uh, hospitals and uh, research and education institutes. I'll give you the status on where we have reached in terms of connecting all the schools in, in my upcoming slides. So this is the DWM infrastructure we have used. As you can see, we have multiple 10 gig networks. Uh, so this is a small stretch from the capital down to the uh, southern uh, district in Bhutan. So, so on the way we have interconnected uh, uh, several districts and on using a DWM infrastructure. So this is the overall uh, logical diagram of how we connect to the rest of the world. Uh, what Dupin does is we uh, have secured a very, very affordable internet rate from our commercial internet service providers. Uh, earlier, the research and education institutes, when they were not connected to Drupal, they were paying about $15 per meg per uh, month. Uh, now they're paying uh, five, uh, uh, which is uh, around $5 now, they're paying around five to $6. Earlier they used to pay around $15. So it has come down by 50% the cost of the internet for our uh, research and education community. So what we do is also, we also interconnect with the IXP, which is called Bhutan Internet Exchange at uh, 10 gigabit per second. And there we have access to all the local uh, CDNs, caches uh, hosted by our telecom and internet service providers. So we have access to Google Cache, we have access to uh, Facebook, Akamai, and we have also access to the government data center at 10 gigabit per second. The government data center, they host uh, critical services like G2G, G2G services. So our RNE community can access all those services at a very high speed. And further, we are connected to uh, the global research and education network using, uh, earlier it used to be one gig, but uh, about a month ago, we have upgraded that capacity to five gigabit per second. So now we, are, uh, we have a high-speed connection to the Global Research and Education Network as well. Uh, we also benefit from the access to the cache hosted by, uh, commercial cache hosted by National Knowledge Network in India. Uh, and then lastly, we connect uh, our members, schools, institutes, hospitals uh, at either 100 meg or uh, one gig, one GPPS. And we charge them, we have a model, we charge them about uh, those who take one gig from us, they pay around 750 US dollars. And those who take uh, 100 meg, they pay us $452 per year. This is per annum. It's a very cheap, uh, affordable uh, uh, internet high-speed connection for all our community. So with regard to new member connectivity, as you can see, uh, as I was telling you, we have reduced the commercial rate uh, uh, to 50%, uh, almost by 50% from US dollar 15 to US dollar six uh, uh, per make per uh, month. And also they 
have a very affordable 100 meg and 1 gig connection. So, so this graph shows the number of new research and education network members that we have connected. In the past uh, 1.5 years, we have connected 210 uh, research and education institutes, schools, and hospitals to our high-speed network in last 1.5 years. All the schools are connected using one gigabit, one GPPS uh, bandwidth. And most of these members, new members, out of 210, 50%, uh, 50 to 60% uh, are located in rural area. So now today we have uh, uh, 238 members. Uh, as you can see in the graph, we still have unconnected uh, members. Uh, we face challenge, number one, because of the, the terrain, like I mentioned earlier, uh, mountainous terrain is very difficult, challenging for us to uh, lay the fibers and connect all the schools in the remote, remote areas. So that's but we are striving and we will be completing by another six months or so. Uh, and we will have almost equivalent to 250 or 60 new members connected to Dukren. And uh, few organizations identified research and education have not been connected because uh, also of the fact that uh, they have been uh, their office are moving from you know one district to another district, so they have uh, they do not have permanent campus. So that was one of the challenge. So, but we uh, are we we are almost sure that we can connect them uh, by in in next six months. So as you can see, this is uh, on the left corner. You can see this is one of the school in the remote area in Bhutan. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, that was in December 2021 uh, uh, when we connected uh, their school to our research and education network. And as you can see also, uh, they have, uh, they, we, we test, we installed the router. What we do is the Dukren team uh, has also procured router for all our uh, new members, uh, the router that supports one gig throughput. So we installed that, we configured for them, we revamped their local area network, and then they, we connect them to uh, Jukren. So as you can see, the speed also uh, is almost uh, one gig uh, through and through. And, uh, and you see the, the equipment on the rack. The, on the left side is the, the before uh, we stepped in, and uh, on the right side is after we stepped in. So we also helped them install, and we also had a small session with the school IT focals, uh, uh, basically, you know, teaching them how to uh, uh, operate and troubleshoot the network when they face issues. On the right side, you see the forest. This is the deep, deep forest in Bhutan, uh, and also you can see that uh, uh, people, our people, are busy uh, stringing the fibers. Uh, so these fibers, uh, uh, we have, as, as, as I reported earlier, we have completed 210 new members uh, connectivity using this uh, last mile fiber. Uh, it was not easy for our people to, to connect uh, the remote areas uh, because of the mountain uh, It Although the distance from the nearest uh, uh, point of presence of ours to the school is Aerial distance is about five, uh, six kilometers, but then they have to go through the, the, the forest. They climb up the hill, they come down, they cross the river streams, and then they lay the fiber. Uh, in some cases, uh, it benefited because we uh, strung this fiber on the distribution uh, electrical poles. So that was the advantage we had because uh, the poles were already uh, laid out, uh, so we use that poles to uh, connect uh, the schools and institutes with the fiber. Uh, the network utilization graph, uh, 
this is basically where we started off uh, the link utilization when when we started and uh, uh, in 2018 as you can see when we first connected uh, the nine colleges under royal university of bhutan they were almost uh, consuming uh, about uh, at the max uh, 95 uh, at the max 352 mbps on average they were consuming about 68 mbps downlink uh, and that was in april 2018 when we had only about 11 uh, true grand members uh, and this is today uh, as you can see we have uh, the international link transit has increased drastically uh, Today, we also do multi-homing. Uh, when we started off, we only leased, we connected to only one upstream provider, commercial upstream provider. Today, we connect to two. So these are two other graphs. And this graph is from the 1st January 2022 to August 2022. Uh, as you can see, the gradual increase in the consumption of the bandwidth by our members as and when we started connecting the new members. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier, we connect to the uh, BICS, uh, Bhutan Internet Exchange Point. Uh, from 2018 to 2019, uh, at the max, we had about 436 uh, Mbps link utilization on the 10 gig uh, link to IXP. Today, we have almost uh, 1.5 to 2 gig uh, consumption by our members. And this is the link to uh, the Global Research and Education Network. Uh, on the top, you will see February to August 2021, uh, the max we use 901 gig, uh, and uh, on average we use 324. But unfortunately, uh, even though we had our members uh, increased from 28 uh, back in 2022, uh, 238 new members, the, there has not been much increase in the utilization of the global research and education link, the link to NKN and TN. On average, we are uh, consuming about 400 to 500 meg uh, Mbps. Uh, also in the last one year during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we have also built a Dukrin data center. Uh, we established a Dukrin data center and we have commissioned it. Uh, what we do is we provide infrastructure as a service to our uh, research and education and into community. Uh, we already host uh, the uh, learning management uh, management system for schools. Uh, we have also deployed Zoom on premise uh, deployment with the help of this uh, Belisage and uh, the ongoing uh, Belisage project and also uh, the uh, facilitating distance learning project uh, led by Bidirian. Uh, and uh, this, this project is basically uh, helped us during the COVID to keep the same momentum of delivering the education uh, classes to all our students. Uh, so from March 2020 till August 2022, we have had our members have carried, uh, conducted about 680,000 Zoom meetings. Uh, and we also host our, all our infrastructure services, DNS, uh, NMS, all in our data center. Our data center is uh, connected to the backbone network uh, using 40 gig, uh, 40 Gbps. Uh, <clears throat> apart from the affordable, high-speed internet access that we provide uh, to uh, our members. As informed earlier, we also have, we also provide computing and storage services for our members, uh, to print Zoom, and also the capacity building. Uh, and, uh, these are some of the pictures of the, the recent uh, capacity development program that we organized for our research and education community. Uh, now, what's next? Uh, as, you, as you can see uh, in our graph, the link to NKN and TN, the Global Research and Education Network, uh, the utilization has not been <clears throat> up, to the, up to our expectation. Uh, 
So we, I, I take this opportunity to uh, uh, request support from the global r and &E, uh, community uh, so that our researchers, our uh, faculties, teachers, uh, students can collaborate uh, with your community, r and &E community. And also, uh, I would like to collaborate the Druk Research and Education Network would like to collaborate and uh, uh, with, with the RNE community uh, to introduce new uh, national research and education network services and application in our network so that uh, uh, we provide good services, not just high speed internet, but other end run services to our RNE community. Because we have now, the infrastructure is in place in Bhutan. Uh, we have connected to 138 research and education institutes and schools and hospitals. So my, my request here to the r &E community is that uh, help us uh, by introducing uh, your end -end services that can be deployed and that can benefit our community. Also, uh, we are a very small team in Drukren. Uh, I myself is the chief architect. I designed the network, but at the same time, I am the project manager. I have only three or four engineers with me. Uh, so it's very critical that the, the, the capability, uh, the human resource development is kept in, uh, uh, in, in line with the, the new technological advancement. So uh, this is my request. And we look forward uh, in collaborating with the, the global r and &E community. Uh, we have till now received uh, support, but we look forward for the continued support from the r and &E community. Uh, thank you. We are on uh, Facebook and uh, as well as on Twitter uh, with the uh, Drukran. If you have also any questions with regard to my presentation or on the Druk Research and Education Network, you can reach me. Uh, at uh, the uh, email address shown in the uh, screen. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kama Jamyang for uh, sharing with us the efforts that Drunk, Drunk Run has uh, done to promote um, efforts to connect the districts and schools and institutes uh, uh, together and uh, of course you mentioned about the challenges that you face on the terrain so it's, it's a very extensive project thank you very much so uh, next let me introduce our fourth speaker so she's a senior systems and software engineer from the research and education educa network for Uganda so let us welcome Miss Helen Nagawungu she'll be delivering her talk on Renu Metro EduROM version 2 Helen, please. Thank you so much, Bain. I'm um, just testing my audio. If at all it's fine, you let me know that I should yeah. start. Is all well? The audio is okay. You want to share your start your slideshow? Yes, it's okay. I, yeah, it's okay. I, Great. Yeah. All right. Hope you can see my screen very well. Yes. Um, my name has been introduced. I'm Helen Nakaungu. I work with the Research and Education Network. Uganda. Um, I'm going to be talking about our initiative to ex extend connectivity uh, beyond uh, uh, institution boundaries. Uh, we called it Metro Edurome version 2.0 to Simbu Day. In our language, that means that uh, uh, we've just started. We have a lot more in store. Yes, let's get started. Just give a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the history, where we came from, why we chose to do Metro Edurome, uh, the development or different setups that we chose to, to work with, then the traffic and user profiles, benefits and challenges, and also some of the things that we, we plan to do or what we call the future. Um, we started or we joined the national roaming operator in 2016. Uh, that's when we installed our very first uh, federation level uh, radius server. And uh, between 2016 to October, 2020, uh, we 
uh, we, we were able to enroll 18 institutions during that period. That is close to five years. But uh, when we decided to move from uh, just being locked, uh, that is Edurum, move Edurum from being locked only inside the institutions to other areas, we managed to uh, add more than 54 institutions uh, on Edurum, making a total of 72 institutions. Uh, some of the strategies that we used before uh, we decided to uh, go Metro Edurum, we used to have direct engineering assistance whereby we could train uh, techies in institutions and also uh, these techies, we could work with them to set up uh, Edurum wherever we do these trainings. Then also we used to hold workshops both in and outside the country. Uh, uh, again, to push the, the initiative of uh, uh, deploying Edurum. Then we formulated also a core engineering team uh, whereby these uh, techies could help here and there in case there is a need uh, to set up Edurum or other services. Um, uh, some of the things we decided to do after uh, October 2020, uh, some of the strategies. Of course, we did not uh, stop the direct engineering assistance and the rest, as I've, I've said previously, but uh, we, we had to think more and were like, okay, let's do uh, Metro Edurum. Let's move this service beyond uh, institution boundaries uh, to other areas uh, within the country. Then also we set up a central database for small institutions. Uh, these institutions uh, could, 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 could enroll uh, to, to the service minus actually having to have a centralized database or organized databases within their institution. We also did uh, donate, or we actually still do, donating access points to small institutions, schools mainly, and some resource, uh, sorry, research institutions. Why we felt uh, we, 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 we pushed to go beyond institutional boundaries, let me, let me not brag, but uh, the main, main uh, catch here was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic where the institutions were closed, that is during the pandemic, where our country closed, closed institutions within the country closed off, like their physical learning, then they went online we were like, okay, what next? We have to move this service uh, to, to reach our, our clients, to reach these researchers, to reach these students, wherever they are. That's when we were like, okay. So since, since, since the institutions have closed, let's move this service to wherever researchers are. Yeah, and uh, also uh, some of the development strategies uh, that uh, we looked at then, we were like, okay, let's rearrange the existing uh, Metro Edurum wireless uh, deployment that were existing at a point rather than going a rudimentary way of uh, maybe deploying our own access point since there, are subs there were some service providers doing the same uh, that were, we wanted to do. So we had to talk to them. Then also we extended uh, Edurum to staff residents uh, uh, in a way of extending connectivity, wherever a staff is, if, be it remote or uh, within the metropolis. Then also, as I mentioned, the managed IDP service for smaller, smaller institutions that could not afford the technical uh, aspects of setting up the service. So uh, those were some of the strategies. Just to take you through uh, different setups, uh, this is the traditional one, the traditional setup whereby we have access points within the institutions broadcasting uh, Edurum. Uh, these access points <coughs> are seated within the institution, then the authentication requests are first relayed to the RADIUS server, which, which is also within the institution. Uh, then uh, in case a user is a visitor uh, to this institution, 
meaning uh, the communication will be relayed to the federation level radius server, which is aware of whatsoever is happening, both within the country and outside. And whichever feedback that uh, the radius, uh, uh, the federation level radius server gives uh, to uh, radius server, the information is relayed back to uh, to the to the access points, and the user is able to to connect. And that is what all uh, is is eligible anyway to connect. Uh, the first setup for the metro edge room, uh, we. We, we are working with two service providers. Uh, this is the first setup whereby Edurom SSIDs are, uh, are broadcasting, uh, uh, Edurom SSID are broadcasted on the service providers access points. Uh, the authentication requests from the access points are relayed to the radius proxy, which is uh, this side of uh, our network from here, actually from here, I don't know whether you can see my cursor. From, from here, this is the service provider's network. Then from here onwards, I can say this is Reynolds network. Though in between we have an IXP, which is the internet exchange provider. So uh, as I've said, uh, uh, Edirom SSIDs are broadcasted on the S service provider's access points. Then the authentication requests are uh, from the access points are relayed to the radius proxy server uh, through the IXP here. Uh, we we try to leverage this uh, IXP, his ex its existence, so that uh, yeah we make good use of it. So the access points have private IP addresses, and uh, these IP addresses are nutted to public uh, IP addresses, which are trusted and communicates with the radius proxy server on the Renum network. Uh, the radius proxy server <laughs> relays communication requests uh, to the federation level radius server, which, which is aware, as I said, uh, what is happening in and outside the country. Uh, so whichever response it gets from the federation level radius server, uh, it, it is relayed back to the radius proxy and uh, the radius proxy server pushes it back to the AP through the, the IXP. So assuming the, the user uh, has gotten an access accept or is allowed to you know, connect to Edurom, uh, it gets the IP from the DHCP server, which is also seated in, in our Renu network and also uh, yeah, after getting the IP address, which is stayed on the REN network uh, through the VLAN X, which is uh, seated here in between, uh, it's provisioned on cross, which is also provisioned on cross connect between REN network and the service provider. And also this VLAN, VLAN X carries uh, user, uh, user traffic and or whatsoever the, the, the user is trying to access. That is setup one. Setup two is pretty simple. Uh, we just have a, a, a cross connect between the service provider and, and our network. This cross connect has two VLANs, VLAN X and VLAN Y, where VLAN X carries uh, user traffic or whatsoever user is trying to access, then the radius authentication traffic is carried through VLAN Y and the rest works the same way. So on the traffic and user pro profiles of, uh, of a metro Edurom, before, uh, when we started in October, when we started moving from the, uh, from the institution boundaries, you can see the traffic was a bit, all, a bit, a little bit more, uh, a little bit small or compared to when we moved up country. So when we decided to move up country covering other districts, you can see a boost in traffic pointing to uh, almost to uh, 210.31 Mbps. Um, again, initially, uh, uh, after, uh, after the deployment of Metro Area, uh, before again, the, the, the up country bit of it, 
the traffic was looking like this. And uh, during this period, we did not have, uh, actually during this period, institutions were closed. So when institutions opened up, you can see they opened up and uh, there was a shoot in a number of successful user login compared to uh, the Edirom, that this is in campus, like on campus Edirom compared to the Metro Edirom uh, uh, success, successful user login. This could indicate a couple of things. One could be uh, just the nature of the Metro Edirom because you can, be ha you can be moving in a car or, or any other means of transport and just get connected to to uh, an SSID for like a few seconds or a, a, less than a minute, that's what I mean. So that is not captured as a successful login, but for the institutions where, uh, where someone just sits and connects to the network, it's, it, 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 it's a successful login. Uh, for unique users, uh, we could capture more unique users on the side of Metro Edurom compared to the on-campus Edurom. This could be uh, to the fact that that to the fact that uh, Metro Edurom is everywhere. It's uh, in cafes, it's in, in some remote areas where you could not expect to find the SSID and things like that. So maybe we have visitors who are who are even coming from outside countries and they, they, they are joining. But uh, for, for on campus, there are a few unique user, uh, unique users captured. By unique user, I mean the first time users uh, that connect to the service. Uh, here we introduced a bit of our home links and uh, you, you can see here they are starting to appear. Uh, still, Metro Edrom still captures more unique users uh, than campus campus visitors. By campus Edrom, we may we do not like uh, monitor the the radius servers within the campus, but those ones who visit, uh, whose requests actually point to the our federation level radius servers, those are the the, the people that we capture. So. For, for the for the internal connections, we do not uh, monitor that. We don't we don't have visibility, so we cannot tell how many uh, how many uh, users that uh, connect to those uh, radius servers within the campuses. So in February 2021, uh, as we had just started doing the Metro Edirom uh, initiative. We noticed uh, that uh, we were seeing a lot of international uh, people connecting to this metro area as compared to our uh, our our institutions, our local institutions within the country. But uh, as we moved on uh, into the year or further within the years, we noticed that actually these uh, international people are reducing and our local institutions are now connecting more to these uh, Metro Edurom uh, access points. This could mean that uh, more institutions are actually joined and also became aware of this service, which was also an advantage on our side. Uh, some of the benefits of uh, the Edurom uh, uh, was the increase in demand for the Edurom service, as we noted when we, when we decided to move from within the institution boundaries, uh, we noticed the high demand for the service. More, more and more institutions came on board wanting to join uh, and have, make use of this service. Also, uh, the, uh, extending the free connectivity service to the to 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 what to the community, it was something uh, very nice on our side. Then also we grew a uh, growing institutional and government trust in the NREN, whereby uh, we started working with the government on some projects. Also, uh, for example, giving us schools to connect and other initiatives. 
uh, also we we ended we we managed to get more members actually joining uh, the the NRN or subscribing for membership uh, because of this service, then also increase public interest and uh, partnership. Then also members now started to distinguish between the NRN and the other commercial service providers, which is still an advantage on our side. Mm -hmm. On difficulties and uh, challenges, uh, we faced a couple of them, or, and actually we are still facing, let me not say we faced because some are still there, but we are trying to see how to deal with them. One of them was to monitor uh, uh, the quality of service that we are extending to, 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 to users. We haven't found the best solution, though we are still trying out things here and there to see what, what will help us monitor the quality of service that we are extending. Then uh, the point of access points being distributed in various uh, locations of which we do not even have control. You, you find access points in ghetto areas where you cannot do a meaningful uh, a kind of connection. Uh, this is due to the fact that we are riding on the other service providers infrastructure. So we had we have no say to say no, you, we don't need a connection. We don't need Edirom in this particular area. So they put in whatsoever areas where they uh, they have presence. Then um, on the pricing model, uh, we have different pricing models uh, that is uh, in line with different service providers. Some are charging us uh, uh, using data volumes, others as, as uh, accounting user sessions, which is not again fair because just imagine someone is on uh, a border border motorcycle and is has, is just passing by an access point and uh, maybe they happen to connect, to have their phones connected in, within a second and they are away. So that is a session counted, which is not fair on our side. Then uh, the perceived competition among commercial service providers. Yes, you cannot avoid that and we are still facing it. Then financial sustain, sustainability <clears throat> on, the, on the side of uh, NREN. That is uh, uh, when we take a look at uh, the growing bills from these service providers whom we use, and also uh, in terms of bandwidth, it's kind of worries worries us. Though we have we we have some plans or some initiatives that we think we should take, but it's also a challenge. Then the bit of sustainability uh, and support on the side of. Uh, uh, on, on the side of the institutions, uh, uh, in most of the institutions complain that uh, they receive mob visitors who visit them to connect to their network. Yes, which is kind of challenge. Uh, for the future, uh, we we are planning to increase the number of uh, Edurom hotspots that is uh, 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 across the country in all. Actually, the plan is in, is in all areas, in all districts. It's still hard, but uh, it's the plan. Then uh, enrolling to remote healthy uh, facilities. Uh, we have a plan of enrolling uh, this service to uh, islands. Uh, we can give an example of Kalangala Island, which is facing a lot of connectivity challenges and, and the rest of uh, challenges. Then also in, enlisting other service providers, this is uh, in line to control uh, or to make uh, the current service providers competitive so that they do not uh, 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 take, take us for granted. Uh, this is just uh, giving you uh, a, a snapshot of what is happening of how many uh, spots that we have that are having uh, Edurom, but to give it more clearly is in the next slide. This is only within Kampala, but uh, when you check uh, this this link, it's called it's edurom.tren.sd.ug. You can get a more details and find where Edurom is located. Yes, that is it. Thank you so much.
Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Helen Nagawangu. Okay, thank you for sharing uh, your initiatives in Uganda for a deployment of Edurom. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, next, I'd like to invite our speakers for a panel session to discuss and uh, also to open the floor to the participants to post any questions you have for the speakers. Uh, so you can post them on the Q&A box as well as uh, via Uber chat. So, um, okay. So let me first look at the Q&A box. I think we did receive a few questions. Okay, uh, first question uh, is addressed to our first speaker, Mr. Ohad. Mushada Senayaki. Okay, uh, the question is, how could you convince the telco operators to move to such remote places? And is there any business case if there's no pandemic? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, Mas uh, Le, and I'm happy to answer that. So what we uh, figured out was, um, if you remember the starting point on my presentation, uh, we had a national digital uh, transformation roadmap. So what that meant was there were certain commitments made on the consumption of uh, such broadband services in the future by ensuring that almost all the public services are going to be digitalized. Um, we looked at all critical government agencies shifting uh, from traditional uh, on-premise services to online services that's enabled by um, online uh, and payment gateways and so on and so forth. So one aspect was giving them that assurance of a long-term roadmap that we made the leadership of all the telecommunication sector where well. uh, number two as i mentioned was the fact that um, it is absolutely good point because see at the end of the day these are listed organizations and there are shareholder obligations in terms of profits for example so it wouldn't make sense for them to invest uh, millions of dollars on rural connectivity which would not bring back the returns on investments that they expect from an urban suburban environment but that's where the telecommunication regulatory commission came into play where we invested 50% of that capital expenditure. So any rural site that we expected the telecommunication um, uh, service providers to invest in, we ensured that we reimburse 50% of that cost from the government. So this was one good example where um, that was taken in good stride by the telecommunication sector as well. Um, and interestingly, um, all of almost all of these rural sites um, has seen tremendous adoption. Certain base stations have hit 90% consumption rates, which was never expected by even the operators. And this is not during only the lockdowns of the COVID pandemic. Um, there's been a persistency on this sort of adoption. So I think as much as we are ensuring that we get the infrastructure up, the fact that more and more services are being digitally transformed, um, more and more education activities are being delivered online, is ensuring that there's a sustainable uh, use case for that uh, business uh, for them to invest in. So this is how we've been approaching it. It's been very transparent, very clear on our digital roadmap. And also we've come into play of investing, which is also very important. I think the imperative is that the fact that the government and the regulator is also investing on the identified rural areas. I think, I hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, answering this question. Okay, so, uh, okay, we have uh, another question is for our third um, speaker from Bhutan. So uh, the question is, who leases the bandwidth to telecom? Who leases the bandwidth to telecom operators, and is it Jackran or Department of ICT? And and also, who manages the transmission network? Is it Jackran or D D O I C T? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Torrid, for your question. So, uh. What we do is, like I mentioned in my presentation, the uh, national fiber infrastructure is owned by the government and government leases the dark fibers to the telecom operators. Now, the telecom operators, uh, they build their own network. So basically, they deploy their equipment to uh, light those fibers. So they don't lease bandwidth. Uh, the tele telecom operators do not lease the bandwidth. Uh, they build their own network, okay? So just like how Druk Research Notification Network has built the network. Uh, 
the second question is who manages the transmission network? Is it Drukren or GOICT? Drukren is a project implemented by Department of IT and Telecom. Uh, so we manage the Drukren DITT manages the transmission network of the Druk Research and Integration Network. Again, the transmission network of the respective operators, telecom operators, internet service providers, they have their own team managing their own transmission network. The, the dark fibers are managed by the uh, power transmission company in Bhutan. Thank I hope you. that clarifies. Yes, thank you. Thank you for answering the questions. Okay, let me see any other questions. Okay, uh, we have a question for uh, Renu, uh, Helen. So, uh, so it was amazing that you got the service provider to join in the Metro Edurom making availability to a wider area. So uh, question is, what was the magic used to convince the service provider? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, moderator, and uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Prof. Francis Lee, for that um, uh, question. Allow me to answer it like this. Um, initially, we approached our service providers, mainly telecos, telecom service providers, and the answer was no. Like we couldn't, they couldn't uh, uh, have our service run alongside what they were doing. We looked like competitors. But again, we were like, okay, we shall not use, lose hope. And uh, during that period, as you mentioned, that it was uh, as if uh, a blessing in, in disguise, uh, that's when COVID hit. So we're like, okay, these are service providers. The telcos refused to you know, work with us. What do we do? So we, we approached a, a uh, some infrastructure service providers who are career neutral in the market. And for them, they had no problem working with us. Remember, we, we are not competitors or something. So we worked with uh, one of them. And actually, when, once things worked out, uh, we, we again re-engaged the, the other service providers that had refused to work with us. But I think if at all things are working fine, everyone wants to associate with you. So luckily enough, they accepted this time around. But also we engaged uh, a bit of the government to see how best we can collaborate with them uh, towards this initiative. And, uh, and, and so far we've received a, a positive uh, feedback from them as, as uh, we have uh, a project, actually we are working with them to connect schools. And actually we are extending Edurum to these schools. Yeah, hope that answers your question, Mr. Francis. Okay, uh, I think we have another question for you also from uh, Prof. Lee. And the question is, what is the financial model that Renu is charging its members to support Edurom? Okay, <laughs> thank you, Professor Lee. Um, financial model that Renu is charging its member institution. Actually, we do not, the answer is we do not uh, charge our member institution as far as Edurum is concerned. Like even the, the, the Metro Edurum, we, uh, we just have an agreement within us. I mean, the Renault and uh, the commercial service providers, and we, 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 we cover that bill uh, within the end run. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we were lucky. We, we, we got a grant, a boat grant that has enabled us to cover most of the costs as far as uh, Metro Edrome is concerned. So bravo to the uh, boat that uh, helped us uh, towards that initiative. Yeah, but uh, of course now uh, the grant was uh, one year, meaning ending uh, uh, 2022, uh, we shall be in space. Uh, that one brings the question, what is the way forward? So we are still scratching our heads on the way forward on that, but uh, I promise you we shall not end. We shall not uh, end it from here. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Helen, for answering the question. 
Okay, so uh, I think we have one more question from uh, Mr. Mohammad Tauri, and it's addressed to you as well. And the question is, is there any commercial agreement between ISPs and Renu? True, true, there is, because you remember that for them, they are making money. And for you, you want to extend the service, for, but for them, they are making mm -hmm. money. Regardless, you have to meet somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, somehow. So true, we have uh, commercial agreements. And uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, some billers according to sessions, like uh, whichever session that they record that has connected to Edirom, there is a fee for that. But also uh, others bill us uh, according to the bandwidth utilization. Yeah. So the answer is yes. We have uh, a commercial agreement with with these service providers. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, yeah. Okay. So, right. Okay. Um. So I think I I have a question for Prof. Uh, Kanchana. Okay. Um. During your presentation, I think you mentioned a section on the applications and uh, one of the applications of the um, your initiative is to deliver educational content to villagers. So, uh, however, you mentioned that uh, because of copyright issues, it couldn't uh, work out. So I thought it was a very good application because um, it's very meaningful. You're able to uh, share this content with the uh, people in the village. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, is it still possible? I mean, what were the specific challenges and is there any way that um, this can be overcome in future, in your opinion? Uh, oh, is my microphone on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh. I, um, I think we need to have a very good representative from, like, for example, organization like APAN or you know, regional organization that do this kind of negotiation with uh, YouTube and all, you know, these people who, who kind of, they have very strict uh, copyright, uh, you know, they don't want us to download and put uh, content in cash and, you know, relay to uh, villages. So, uh, this is why we uh, we had we I I tried to talk to them myself, but mm -hmm. didn't succeed. But if we manage to uh, have a group of uh, people representing the region, I think that may make things moving. I kind of left this issue for many years because of the you know I was alone. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Ken. Thanks, Prof. Panchana, for sharing. Okay. Um, okay, so I think uh perhaps I have another colleague uh who's assisting me in the QA. Uh Simon, can I check whether are, are there any questions in the Uva? Uh no questions in Hoover. Okay. I see Thank I you. see a question from uh Mohammed. Oh, okay, sure, sure. There's a new question. It's ask, yeah, yeah, he's asking yeah. me, um, but the way you have set it up, I believe the Edrium users don't use the ISP's bandwidth. Yeah. Am I right? The ISP's bandwidth, you mean uh, the service providers? Yes, the have maybe the service providers bandwidth. Anyway, uh, pretty, pretty, okay. Uh, I can say they are using uh, Renault's bandwidth. Yes, I think that is that is best uh, explained because we have a financial agreement with uh, between the uh, uh, service providers and on, on our side, and this is mainly infrastructure. But the bandwidth is ours, not ISPs. There is other questions, uh, Bin. Which vendors? I think yeah. this is one to me. It's for yes. I think uh, yeah. I think we have another question uh from Mr. Alam um, Ahmad, and the question is which vendors DWDM and CWDM equipment use Dracran? So maybe Mr. Kama uh, Jamyang, you want to answer that question? 
Thank you for the question. <clears throat> for the <clears throat> uh, CWDM, we have used uh, uh, Gigalite. And for DWDM, we have used uh, Sopto as well as Packet Lite. Right. So I, uh, okay, sure. So I think you have answered this question. So I think that's that's fine. Okay. Um. Okay. So I think uh right now we I don't see any further questions. So, um, we can actually um maybe before I close the panel session, uh, maybe the speakers do you all have anything to say, or anything you want to sh uh share with the. Oh, yeah, okay, uh, Prof. Kanchana, please. Yeah, I, I like to add on. Uh, there was one question asking how to attract uh, uh, telco to go to rural area and so on. Um, I think from my experience, you you need to have the what the one of the key uh, decision uh, you know factor is the the number of users. So. Uh, if we can start, uh, you know, this kind of small community network in the area that is uh, very isolated and building up uh, users who demand for connectivity, then a uh, commercial provider would come in. And the reason, one of the reasons why we stay on, even though the commercial providers already come in, is because I uh, we can kind of uh, um, make sure that the price is not too high, you know, because we can charge a very low rate. So commercial provider uh, would not uh, set very high price. They have to to be com to stay competitive, you know, to keep that uh, price very low because we can offer very low rate. So I think. Uh, even though we are small, we are, uh, in a way, effective. So I hope that uh, you can try this experiment in your own, you know, different countries. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Kanchana. Um, the other speakers, do you have any uh, remarks? So I think, yeah. uh, uh, thank you for arranging the session. It's been quite, quite fruitful and, and quite eye open on different approaches made to uh, driving forward accessibility and affordability. I think which is a imperative as we move forward on enabling um, uh, education as well as ensuring that we uh, reduce the digital divide. Um, as we go along, I think you've got to be quite innovative and I think partnerships are key in building, especially with the telecommunication operators. And I think Professor Kanchana's uh, case study was fantastic in terms of bootstrapping. Um, there are non-affordable target audiences that we need to address and hopefully even that zero rated uh, uh, approaches that we've also done. Um, so it's got to be a, a blended, well-balanced approach, I believe that we could take forward. Uh, so thank you uh, for the PAN 54 session and it was a pleasure to be part of this. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Kama, Jamya, and Helen. You have any uh, concluding remarks? Maybe, maybe, yeah, Helen, please. I, yeah, mm. I can go first. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah, to sure. Thank, to, thank, okay. uh, mm. to thank the audience for listening to us, but also to thank, especially uh, Dr. Lee, for spotting me somewhere. <laughs> I know it was uh, a bit of uh, a crazy environment, but he supported me and was like, you have to speak <laughs> at this uh, panel conference. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Yes, thank you. Maybe Mr. Mr. Kama Jamia. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yes. you so much, uh, Lindley, uh, for coordinating this. Uh, I also want to thank Professor Francis for uh, inviting me to be part of the panelists uh, for today's session. Uh, uh, thank you for all the participants for your kind attention. Uh, hopefully, this is the last APN uh, uh, meeting that we have uh, virtually, and hopefully we will be able to see each other face to face in the next APN. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a good one. Yeah. Come on. Yes. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> that's a okay. good one. That's a good one. Yes, we have to. We hope to see each other physically rather than remote. <laughs> sure. So actually, I, I'm uh, trying to move uh, as in because I probably is actually in this meeting. So um, I'm seeing whether we can allow, I mean, to promote him to a panelist so he can speak as well. So, okay, yeah, probably is here. So he can, yeah. <laughs> so he can come in and I think he's, probably can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you all. Yeah. So yeah. probably, uh, do you have any uh, remarks or any comments for the, the speakers and the session as well? Hi, my apologies. I was uh, on from the airport to my home. <laughs> um, just uh, landed in Singapore just now. But um, I would like to thank Binde for uh, chairing this session. But I would like to thank all of you, Kanchana, Oshada, Kama, and Helen. Uh, the coincidental meetup in Italy uh, has proved amazing in the sharing. How we have each taken different path uh, to meet the challenge uh, for rural access and education. Uh, I think it's very important. It reminds me of my younger days when books were critical and we have mobile uh, vans that carry the libraries that they all comes around and, and they, were, they were the way we spread it to the rural area. And now likewise, we have to use technology and see how we can move technology uh, so that it's accessible in the rural area, not only just the urban. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof Lee. So uh, I think now, uh, before we end the session, can I request uh, we can have a photo taking session? So, um, right. I think right now we will take one photo with the myself and the panelists, and then uh, after that we'll do it with all the participants, okay? So maybe just look at the camera and smile. <laughs> okay. One, two, three. Uh, okay. Okay, next, uh, I hope the, I mean, I like, I like to take a group photo with participants as well. So um, we'll be promoting y'all to panelists for all the attendees. Then appreciate uh, maybe your, your can switch on your cameras, then we'll do a group photo together. So we are in the process of upgrade, upgrading your now. <laughs> Just give us a minute. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll need to actually change them to co hosts as well for them to share. So could um, you help to do that too, Binley, once they come in? So I think, uh, yes, I'm helping to promote the panelists now. Okay. Also to co-host as well, once they're in. Otherwise, they won't be able to share. As in the... Yeah, so yeah. everyone needs to everyone needs to become a co-host. To be able to come share in. Share the here. screen, to share this, share the um, video. video. Yes. Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll help to get that done. Okay, we're slowly getting people to come in. So, okay. Is it okay? Mm. okay. Ah, and um, and I'm surprised I have some members from my end range. This is this is nice. <laughs> okay, so uh. Whoever is, uh, maybe if appreciate if you can switch on your cameras, uh, then we are in the process of getting the rest to come in as well. We still have about, about 14 more to come in. I, I, mean, I cannot start my video. <laughs> you can, you can enable it. <laughs> enable it. Uh. Okay. Uh, let me try. Uh. Um, Prophet, you should be good now. Um, your co-host, so you should be able to um activate. Derek, your camera is uh, not showing well. Hi, this is Singapore with the rainbow. <laughs> wow. <Okay. laughs> 
Okay. It's good, so, to, it's good to see a number of people. Hello. So, yeah, Simon, so uh, are we, is it complete already or? I think we have about 12 who are still in the list. I think we have sent um, the hmm. request to promote to panelists, but not everyone. But and it depends on who wants to accept or not. So. Okay, okay. So everything has been so. Whoever is here who has accepted, like, okay, no, no worries. So I think uh, I mean I hope all of y'all can switch on your cameras. Then uh, okay, then my colleague uh, Linda will help to do the screenshots. Okay, so uh, let's look at the camera and smile. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We just hold on for a while more. Okay. okay. I think it should be fine now. Okay, sure. So um Okay, so thanks very much. Um I think uh thanks very much for uh spending your time with us today. And I also appreciate the speakers who have come forward to share. And uh, thanks all who are here and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Stay, Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.